Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Everyone in the back as well? Great. Uh, so welcome, everyone, and good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for the public information meeting for the Eastern Connecticut Corridor Rail and Transit Feasibility Study. Um, I'd like to thank uh, a few particular attendees. We have State uh, Representatives Nolan as well as uh, Representative Bumgarner tonight here um, attending the meeting, so thank you for attending tonight and for your support. Um, my name is Elise Greenberg. I'm a transportation planner and the project manager from Connecticut DOT in the Office of Policy and Planning. I'm also joined tonight by Jill Cahoon, the project manager from our consultant team at AECOM. Um, and we also have um, the consultant team from WSV who helped organize this event tonight, so thank you to them. Um, and we're also joined by other uh, DOT staff from the Office of Policy Planning and um, the Office of Rail, as well as the Office of Transit and Ride Sharing. They'll be um, joining us up front during the question and answer session to help answer your questions tonight. Um, before we get started, um, I just want to remind everyone that the purpose of this meeting is to present um, the Eastern Connecticut Corridor Rail and Transit Feasibility Study findings. Um, the study team here tonight is aware that there have been recent announcements of temporary service impacts due to construction and also near-term reductions to regular Shoreline East service. Um, please be aware that tonight's meeting is focused solely on the findings of the Eastern Connecticut Rail and Transit Feasibility Study, and there will be separate public hearings uh, conducted in the first week of October regarding the recent communications about Shoreline East service. Also, anyone with questions or comments regarding those announcements or current service changes um, is encouraged to reach out via email to DOT dot proposed transit changes at ct.gov. Um, but thank you again for attending tonight's meeting and we look forward to now presenting you with uh, the Eastern Connecticut Rail and Transit Feasibility Study findings. Um, I'm going to start off by reading our Title VI statement. So in accordance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, no person shall, on the basis of race, color, or national origin, be excluded from participation or subject to discrimination in the development of this project. You can find more about your Title VI rights by visiting https colon forward slash forward slash portal ct gov forward slash dot forward slash business forward slash office dash of equity forward slash title dash vi dash page. Also, um, we encourage you following this meeting to take a voluntary post-meeting survey um, that will allow us to gather feedback and uh, continue to improve upon our public information process. This is for meetings. Um, and you can take that survey at https colon forward slash forward slash portal dot ct dot gov forward slash Connecticut DOT survey. And you can also screen the QR code on the slide to go right to that survey as well. Um, this meeting is being recorded, and a recording of the formal presentation will be posted to Connecticut DOT's YouTube account after uh, tonight's meeting. And closed captioning, including non-English translation options, will also be available on YouTube. Um, and the Connecticut Department of Transportation, or Connecticut DOT, operates its programs and services without regard to race, color, and national origin in accordance with the Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. Any person who believes she or he has been aggrieved by any unlawful discriminatory practice under Title VI may file a complaint with the Connecticut DOT. For more information on the Connecticut DOT's civil rights program and the procedures to file a complaint, you can contact the Connecticut DOT Title VI coordinator at 860-594-2169 or by visiting www.ct.gov forward slash DOT. And here you'll see the Title VI statement in Spanish as well. So moving on to the presentation tonight. 
Um, as I mentioned, we will be presenting the findings of the Eastern Connecticut Corridor Rail and Transit Feasibility Study. We also refer to this study in short as ECRTS, so you'll be hearing that acronym throughout the night. We'll start tonight's presentation with an overview of the study and a bit of background information. I'll then review some existing conditions as well as information um, about the public transportation market. And then I'll turn it over to Jill Cahoon, who will go over the preliminary feasibility assessment findings. And then go, she'll go into more detail in the corridor station and station refinements service strategies, whoops, cost, revenue, and ridership projections, greenhouse gas reduction estimates, and economic benefits of all of the short and long-term strategies. And then we'll wrap it up with the conclusion and we'll um, invite the rest of the DOT folks out and have a question and answer session. And what would be most helpful tonight during that question and answer session, in which we'll also receive um, your comments, is to um, hear questions and comments specifically on the findings of the study that are presented in the report. Um, that will help us um, be able to take that feedback and incorporate it as we work to finalize the report uh, that will go to the legislature. So this study was initiated by Connecticut DOT, uh, uh, by our Connecticut legislature, uh, with a direction to investigate the feasibility and market for extending Shoreline East Rail Service to the state of Rhode Island, establishing a new passenger rail service from the city of New London to the city of Norwich, establishing a new passenger train station in the town of Groton and Stonington Borough, and also looking at extending other ground transportation systems in the eastern region of the state and providing interconnectivity between such system and rail lines. Uh, this is a feasibility study. It's a data-driven first step um, in the process of evaluating the viability for potential service. Then depending on the findings of this study, further uh, increasingly detailed studies and designs may follow. In terms of the study process, uh, we developed this process to be extremely comprehensive and really uh, look at all of the information to determine viability of service from um, an infrastructure as well as an operational standpoint and also the transit market for rail and bus transit. Uh, we started by looking at uh, existing conditions um, and along the way throughout the entire study, we've done a variety of different stakeholder as well as public engagement activities, um, which I'll get into in a little bit. Um, but in also looking at uh, existing conditions, we looked at the um, study area characteristics, including demographics, employment, uh, major trip generators, travel patterns, um, and then we also looked at um, all of that fed into what we called the preliminary feasibility assessment where we took a deeper dive at looking at uh, infrastructure as well as the corridor's operational capacity um, and potential station locations. Um, and then we continued along. That uh, preliminary feasibility assessment allowed us um, to refine the corridors because we, along the way, identified some key constraints. Um, so we, re we refined the corridors as well as the station potential locations, and we continued to look in further detail about um, potential operations and equipment needs. Uh, we also looked at bus transit connections and what sort of bus transit enhancements could happen in the region. We looked at ridership forecasts, uh, operation as well as capital cost projections, um, and all of that uh, got rolled up along with uh, economic and environmental benefits into the final draft report. So in looking at the study area, um, Amtrak currently owns and operates the right-of-way um, along the Northeast Corridor um, in the study area going from New London to Westerly, Rhode Island, operating at their current stations of New London, Mystic, and Westerly, Rhode Island. Uh, CT Rail Shoreline East service also operates from New Haven to New London with connections to CT Rail's Hartford Line in New Haven as well as Metro North's uh, New Haven Line in New Haven. Um, and then along the Thames River Corridor, uh, Genesee and Wyoming Incorporated owns um, the rail right-of-way along both sides of the river and operates uh, unscheduled freight service uh, along the west side of the Thames River or the Palmer Line, as well as the east side of the Thames River on the Norwich Line. 
Um, and typically, they run about one to two trains a day to meet market demand. In the study area, there's also a variety of transit services. There are seven transit providers that operate in the study area. That includes 21 bus, fixed bus routes, three on-demand services, two inner city bus routes, fer four ferry routes, and a variety of active transportation options. Um, there, the bus transit service in the study area is largely operated by SEAT or Southeast Transit District, um, but there is also a uh, route that is operated by Wyndham Area Transit District as well as um, as well as uh, Nine Town Transit District. And the Westerly Station is served by a flex zone as well as a fixed route that are operated by Rhode Island Public Transportation Authority, or RIPTA. So in looking at the characteristics of the study area and population characteristics specifically, uh, the study area is comprised of a combination of urban, rural, and suburban communities. In particular, Norwich, Groton, and New London have the greatest uh, level of densities in comparison to their neighbors. They also have the highest um, levels of ethnic diversity as well as um, lower levels of household, average household income in comparison to their neighbors. And the federal government has developed a um, mapping tool that is aligned with their Justice 40 federal program. Um, and within that program, um, they identify uh, communities that they um, designate as disadvantaged uh, census tracts uh, based on a number of different uh, threshold criteria, including things such as leg legacy uh, pollution, um, health, access to transportation, uh, climate change, and so within the study area, there are census tracts that um, are included as um, Justice 40 census tracts within Norwich, um, New London, Groton, and Westerly. And then on top of that, in Connecticut, the Department of Economic and Community Development also designates um, distressed mu municipalities in the area, and in 2022, uh, there were four municipalities in the study area that were on this list of top 25 distressed municipalities in the state. Um, so what this means essentially is that there are um, a lot of areas within the study area that could potentially uh, benefit by having greater access to transportation um, and growth opportunities. When we looked at existing conditions in the study area, we also looked at where people are going to and moving from. Uh, so what we see on this slide in the top map is where people that live in the study area are traveling to for work. And so we can see that study area residents are largely going to Hartford um, and areas within the study area and um, up toward Providence. And then on the bottom map, we can see where those that work in the study area live. So the most of study area employees um, live within the study area or directly around the study area, um, as well as up toward uh, Hartford, Providence, and Northeast Connecticut. In addition to looking at where people are going to and from, we also looked at traffic volumes. So what we can see on this chart um, is the average daily traffic volumes to major destinations in the study area, including Foxwoods, the Groton Submarine Base, Mohegan Sun, Mystic, New London Center, Norwich Center, Pfizer and Electric Boat, Stonington and Westerly. Uh, and this data was pulled from a third-party vendor called Streetlight, um, which pulls information from cell phone data um, and collects that. So this data um, in red, you can see the average weekday trips. Um, and in green, you can see the average weekend trips. And in blue, you can see the average across all days. And so um, unsurprisingly, uh, destinations like Foxwoods and Mohegan Sun uh, see a lot of weekend traffic, and destinations like Pfizer and Electric Boat 
and the Groton Submarine Base see a lot of weekday traffic. So as I mentioned, throughout the study process, there's been a lot of public and stakeholder engagement. Along with the study steering committee, we also met throughout the study with various working groups consisting of transit and rail operators, um, municipal staff as well as municipal chief elected officials. Uh, we also had a customer focused working group to uh, meet with organizations that have a better understanding of the broad um, diverse needs of the communities in the study area. And we also had a initial round of public meetings last December. And during that time, throughout the month of December and beginning of January, we had a public survey. So all of these existing conditions, as well as feedback um, from the public and stakeholders, um, was rolled up and um, into the preliminary feasibility assessment, which uh, Joe will get into explaining that process now. Thank you, Elise. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, I will be, oh, thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. And uh, we appreciate all of you being here. Thank you, Elise. And uh, I'll jump into the results of the preliminary feasibility assessment. Um, I'm going to, I'm short. It's hard to see all of you. <laughs> um, so our slides are on a timer. So we are um, exceeding our time limit. So we'll, we'll push it back. <laughs> so for the preliminary feasibility assessment, as Elise mentioned, uh, we conducted a lot of analysis that led to um, the, uh, from the existing conditions, as well as future projections to help us to look at the preliminary feasibility along each of the corridors, as well as with the ground transportation solutions. So for the study corridors, uh, what we looked at, as Elise mentioned, were the northeast corridor from New London to Westerly, the east and west sides of the Thames River, as well as the Groton Secondary and Ground Transportation Solutions. We also looked at, oh, thank you. <laughs> Multi-talented, thank you. <laughs> Um, so we also did look at uh, station areas and possible stations um, within each of these, uh, these uh, corridors. So looking at each of these corridors, we divided them into seven station area zones. And within each of the zones, we looked at two or three different possible station locations. This included the west side of the Thames River, the east side of the Thames River, the Groton Secondary, as well as the station areas mentioned in the legislation, including Groton, Stonington, uh, and, uh, Groton, Mystic, Stonington, and Westerly. Um, when we looked at each of the potential station locations, we looked at things like um, environmental uh, considerations site constraints in each, in each of these areas, compatibility with surrounding land uses, um, transit supportive land use and walkability uh, for station areas, connecting transit and bike ped um, that's already bike, bicycle and pedestrian um, solutions that were already near these areas, market development potential and potential for transit oriented development, as well as operational feasibility um, for, the, uh, for the service in, in each of these corridors. Perfect timing. Uh, so for uh, throughout the course of this um, assessment, we identified some primary constraints that ended up being um, really impactful into the options that we looked into for rail service solutions in particular. Uh, this includes um, the, um, the Thames River Movable Bridge, which is shown in the center photo of this slide. Um, the, Thames River Movable Bridge is operated by the U.S. Coast Guard, and it is open for marine traffic and closed when trains go by. Um, and the uh, U.S. Coast Guard determines how much time in each hour that bridge can be closed to marine traffic to allow the trains to go by, uh, with a preference, of course, for marine traffic. Uh, so there's only so much time in every hour that the bridge can be closed for trains. So that was a, a large constraint. So from our um, corridor capacity analysis, uh, we identified that one additional train per hour in each direction would be possible to go across the, uh, the Thames River Movable Bridge. 
Uh, so that meant that in order to uh, move forward with any services that moved east of New London, um, we were only looking at one train per hour in each direction that could cross that bridge. Um, also, Amtrak of right now runs across that bridge several times a day um, and is looking to expand their operations as well, has plans to expand their operations. So any potential extension of Shoreline East service beyond New London would need to be coordinated uh, with Amtrak. And Amtrak also owns the right-of-way. Uh, so coordinating schedules as well as coordinating with the U.S. Coast Guard Academy would be required to operate east of New London. Uh, we also looked at uh, the uh, constraint of having to construct high-level platforms for the um, Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, uh, compliance, as well as for the uh, M8 uh, equipment that's operated on Shoreline East that does require high-level platforms. So right now, at Mystic Station, uh, for example, uh, there's low platforms, and so higher-level platforms would need to be constructed, the same thing in Westerly. Um, as well as some other locations um, along the corridor. Uh, additionally, we are looking at the potential for um, new stations, new station locations. As I mentioned, we looked at about 18 stations to start. We were um, screening through those stations as well as through the alignments through this process. Uh, and so we originally looked at 18 different station locations and uh, we, we screened that to seven station locations, and we'll get into that uh, more in, in a moment. Um, but ex uh, building additional um, uh, station locations does, of course, uh, create a potential constraint. And then, of course, uh, the equipment needs a place to be stored um, and also to be moved out of the way, the trains, so that Amtrak can pass or to turn the train around uh, in this new service zone for Shoreline East. Uh, so we did also have the, the constraint of space for uh, yard uh, storage for trains and turning trains. So because of these constraints, as well as the results of the preliminary feasibility assessment, we identified uh, that the corridors to move forward for additional analysis uh, would focus on providing um, service along the main line, the Northeast Corridor, with that one train that can go across the uh, Thames River Movable Bridge and um, looking at service between New London and Norwich along the west side of the Thames River. In each of these corridors, we did look at potential new station locations. As I mentioned, um, seven station locations. That includes a station, a new station in Groton along the main line, um, an alternative station to Mystic, a station in Stonington, and then the existing uh, Westerly station with the platform upgrades. Um, and then in the Norwich um, to New London um, corridor, the Thames River corridor, we looked at possible station locations near the U.S. Coast Guard Academy and Connecticut College in Montville uh, near Mohegan Sun and then in Norwich near the Norwich Transportation Center. So coming out of this feasibility analysis, we identified both shorter-term strategies as well as longer-term strategies. The shorter-term strategies include expanding uh, the bus and ground transportation services in the area, building the market, and looking at solutions such as transit priority solutions along routes 32 on the west side of the Thames River and route 12 along the east side of the Thames River as connections between the major employers in the area as well as the uh, main residential uh, areas uh, in the region, um, improving and speeding up uh, bus service, making it more direct, uh, making it um, more frequent and making it more attractive and competitive uh, with a with the personal uh, vehicle. We also then identified longer term uh, strategies, which included expanding um, shoreline east service along the northeast corridor, as I mentioned, between New London and Westerly, and then also looking at the potential for expanding uh, passenger rail or commuter rail service between New London and, and Norwich. And we'll get into more detail on each of those uh, service plans in the next few slides. Um, as I mentioned, we'll talk about service strategies and then, as Elise mentioned, we'll talk a lot about costs, operating costs, um, capital costs, greenhouse gas reductions, uh, and other pieces of information associated with these service um, strategies. 
Starting with the shorter term or transit service strategies, um, these transit service strategies are very robust and could be the solution uh, in the region. They are standalone, they do not need to be paired uh, with, uh, with rail service uh, expansion. Um, and these um, transit service solutions are, uh, we'll talk about them in two different ways, one for fixed route transit solutions and one for demand response transit solutions, uh, which paired together uh, form the network and the system um, improvements. So for fixed route services, we're looking at uh, streamlining, uh, streamlining some services, making service faster, increasing the frequency, adding days of service uh, to, to the uh, schedule of available service, and as I mentioned, um, employing uh, some transit priority solutions, uh, especially on those connections between New London and Norwich and Groton and Norwich along the Route 32 and Route 12 corridors, as well as other solutions um, in Mystic, uh, as well as between uh, major employers. And then in conjunction with those fixed route um, op opportunities, fixed route strategies, we also looked at some demand responsive service strategies. So right now, um, there is microtransit service in New London and Stonington, um, as well as the Flex Zone, uh, as, as Elise mentioned, operated by RIPTA in Westerly. And we looked at adding an additional uh, zone in Groton uh, in order to make some of those first mile, last mile uh, connections from the higher capacity transit solutions as well as expanding the hours of service and the days of the week that these services are operated. So together, the fixed route and uh, demand response transit service solutions would be a dramatic increase in the amount of service provided in the region. It would actually uh, increase the annual uh, hours of service by uh, nearly 53%. Um, and we looked at what it would, what the ridership projections would look like, as well as the greenhouse gas reductions associated with these service changes, both in the, sta the uh, bus standalone solution, as well as the bus possibly paired with rail uh, solution to avoid any duplication of services in the future if rail were also to be uh, implemented. Uh, from a modeling standpoint, we used 2028 as our horizon year uh, for the bus service solutions, and we use 2035 as our horizon year for modeling uh, for the rail service solutions. Uh, so you can see that we're looking at, with the solutions, possibly 25% increase in ridership, um, quite a lot of reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and these are for the service changes only. There would be additional um, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions uh, with electrifying the fleet, which is the something that the state and the agencies are working towards doing. And also, SEAT received a grant um, to electrify their bus facility um, as well, which would all contribute to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, more than what's shown on this slide. Uh, we also estimated operating costs for these fixed route and demand responsive uh, service strategies. For the fixed route cost estimates, we'd be looking at an approximately 2.5 million additional dollars needed per year to operate those expanded services, an increase of 35%. Um, and that number varies a little bit if we are also looking at a rail service solution paired with it because there would be fewer bus, uh, there would be some potential for duplication of bus service, so bus service would be modified to fit if, if a rail service strategy was also looked into. Um, from the demand response uh, perspective, again, we were looking at adding an additional zone as well as additional hours of service and days of service um, for those demand response types of, of services, which would be an additional uh, $1.5 million a year to operate uh, those additional services. Additionally, uh, we looked at the capital costs associated with uh, the transit service solutions. Uh, this includes the additional uh, vehicles that would be needed to operate the fixed route services, so those are the, the buses. The additional vehicles needed to operate demand response services, probably vans or small buses, uh, as well as transit signal priority, uh, where, where buses are given priority uh, along the roadway above, ahead of the um, general flow of traffic to speed up bus service, as well as other transit um, 
uh, priority solutions, including some roadway work. Um, we also looked at the possibility of changing from a flag stop system. So right now, seat is a flag stop system, so folks can flag down the bus almost anywhere, uh, and that can slow the bus down by, by quite a lot um, and actually decrease access to, to transit service. So we looked at the possibility of um, changing that to a fixed stop um, uh, solution with, with uh, bus stop signage and, and shelters and other waiting amenities and things like that. So um, in this case, for the transit service strategies, we're looking at nine to $10 million in capital uh, ex expenses. Um, and that is a capital cost or a one-time uh, capital expense. And then the operating costs are the things that happen every year, they're recurring. Moving on to the rail service strategies, as I mentioned, we uh, looked at um, service strategies in each of the corridors along the Northeast Corridor from New London to Westerly and along the Palmer Line, which is the west side of the Thames River. For each of these corridors, we looked at a Shoreline East through service which would be an extension of Shoreline East from New Haven as it is now, continuing straight through to either terminal location, either Westerly or Norwich. And then in each corridor, we also looked at a shuttle service solution, which would be just to operate from New London to either one of those um, uh, terminal locations. So. Um, in looking at those uh, solutions, uh, we uh, were able to uh, identify that extending shoreline east to westerly through New London uh, did a, 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 a touch the transit market uh, was the optimal option, and then operating the shuttle service like a branch line between New London and Norwich. Uh, was uh, was a good solution. That being said, we also identified an opportunity to have a hybrid option um, for the Thames River corridor and along the Palmer Line, and that would have the sh the train service operated as a shuttle most of the time between New London and Norwich. But then a few trains a day would come through. Um, f through from New Haven through New London directly to to Norwich. So. It ended up that the hybrid option uh, was, the, was the optimal option for the Thames River Corridor. So we looked into the Shoreline East Extension uh, service to Westerly in more detail, as well as the hybrid option in um, the Thames River Corridor. So for the Shoreline East Extension to Westerly, that's 12 round trips per day on weekdays. It's a 22 to 24 minute uh, trip time one way. Uh, it would require a new operating schedule with the service that's uh, in place today with Shoreline East. And uh, this assumes that one of the morning and one of the afternoon through trains from Stanford would be reinstated. So that's built into this service option. Uh, and this is an additional 159,000 projected riders per year. Then on the Thames River Corridor along the Palmer Line, again, you, looking at the hybrid uh, example, that would be eight northbound and 10 southbound trips per day on weekdays. Uh, that would be about a 27 minute uh, trip time one way. And there would be 15 trips that would be shuttle trips just between New London and Norwich, and three trips that would be Shoreline East Extension from New Haven through New London to Norwich. And that's um, a ridership projection of an additional 126,000 uh, riders per year. So in order for uh, these services uh, to, to be implemented, um, there's a substantial capital cost um, associated with building these solutions. So for the Northeast Corridor, the Shoreline East Extension of Service, we were looking at the three, um, the three new stations, as well as high-level boarding platforms at several locations. Uh, also looking at um, electrifying uh, some storage space um, so that trains can be moved out of the, the way in order to allow Amtrak trains to pass. Also some track to turn the trains around, as well as um, additional train sets to operate the service. So that's a $243 million um, or so investment in 2023 dollars. Uh, then on the Palmer line, looking at that hybrid service example, uh, we are looking at three um, new stations uh, as well along that corridor, substantial track upgrades, um, technology solutions, other infrastructure, 
uh, as well as yard space and new train sets to operate that service. So that would be a $636 million capital investment along the Palmer Line in order to, to, oper to build uh, the infrastructure needed to operate the services that I was just talking about. Uh, then, uh, to operate those rail services, um, we also estimated the operating costs to operate the train service. Uh, we uh, looked at the baseline and the difference from the baseline service of, uh, from June 2023. So for the Northeast Corridor Shoreline East Extension to Westerly, uh, that's about, uh, to operate that service would be about um, $218 thousand uh, dollars a day uh, for an annual total of 52.3 million dollars to operate uh, that train service from new um, through service from New London to Westerly then for the Thames River corridor along the Palmer line uh, that shuttle service between New London um, and, and Norwich with a few trains a day through from uh, from New Haven that would be um, an operating cost of $137,000 a day, or about $33 million uh, per year. And again, this is associated with, between the two corridors, both combined, uh, about uh, 286,000 uh, riders <laughs> per, uh, per year, new riders. So in order to um, realize the benefits of the investment in rail and transit uh, strategies, um, there, are some, um, there are some things that can be done to make it um, uh, more, more successful and to realize those uh, economic benefits over time. Uh, there are some short-term benefits associated with um, construction jobs and the creation of the infrastructure associated with both uh, transit and rail solutions. Um, there's also, um, as we've uh, talked about to some extent uh, during this presentation, and, and, and probably all of you who, are, who live here may be, be aware, there are some affordable um, housing, um, uh, there's a need for some affordable housing in, in this area, as well as improved access to higher paying jobs. Uh, so those are benefits that could be realized through uh, investment in rail and transit uh, strategies in this, in this region. And of course, pairing rail and transit uh, investment with land use policies that promote density and walkability and multimodal connectivity uh, across all modes um, are, are the, the way to make those connections uh, between uh, in investment and realizing those economic benefits. With that being said, um, we did also look at uh, transit-oriented development along the corridors. Um, during the first part of the preliminary feasibility assessment, we did look at a corridor scan for transit-oriented development. And then more recently, we looked at transit-oriented development at those seven station areas uh, that I mentioned in more detail. So compared to other um, Northeast Corridor cities, this area does have um, lower median income and less job growth and a smaller share of, of professional jobs. Um, and there is a housing affordability uh, challenge. About 44% of all renters uh, in, the, in the region are cost burdened, which means that they pay more than 30% of their income uh, towards housing. So uh, we did have a look uh, at the uh, multifamily housing as well as affordable multifamily housing in the area. I know these maps are a bit small, but they're also on the boards. Um, so what these maps show are a whole bunch of dots um, with multifamily housing options in these station areas. And then when we look at affordable housing options within that same area, that number, the number of dots uh, is, is reduced pretty, pretty dramatically. Uh, so there is um, there is an opportunity there for for um, um, a, a opportunity for affordable uh, housing options. Uh, the Thames River corridor is also a good uh, candidate to think about uh, in the future for transit-oriented development. There are about a thousand vacant parcels um, along the corridor. And as we were talking about before, there's a, um, and Lisa was talking about some of the demographic and socioeconomic uh, characteristics um, of, of some of the communities in the region. And so there's some economic propensity um, for need for transit service uh, solutions and propensity for, for transit ridership. Um, so at this point in time, I will hand it back over to Elise. Thank you, Jill. So thank you for 
presenting in detail the uh, shorter term and longer term transit and rail strategies of the study. Um, so in conclusion, as Joe mentioned, the transit strategies could be implemented to satisfy short term as well as long term transportation needs in the study area, um, and especially along the Thames River corridor. Um, however, in the future, rail strategies may also be viable, in particular along the Northeast Corridor, where there is a stronger market for rail. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier on, this is a feasibility study. So this is a very preliminary first step in what could be the project, uh, project development life cycle. Um, so additional studies or designs would be needed for any rail and transit strategies to be implemented. Um, and at the moment, any next steps are currently unfunded. And so to get a better picture of the project life cycle timeline, um, the Federal Transit Administration, or FTA, uh, has a um, project development life cycle that includes four large phases. Um, that includes uh, project or systems planning, um, project development, engineering and final design, and then construction. And then after a project is constructed, um, there is also a need for the operations and then maintenance as well of the uh, service and um, infrastructure and equipment. Um, so this project in, or this uh, timeline for the project life cycle process could um, take anywhere on average from six to 20 years, depending on the specific project. There is also potential um, if one strategy or combination of the strategies um, that were presented tonight as sort of uh, a full bucket of short-term strategies and long-term strategies, um, any, if any one were uh, studied further and determined viable, um, they could move forward independently and be incrementally phased in. Um, and those incremental phases would then still have to move through as individual projects through the project life cycle. Um, and so a good example of a, of a recently <laughs> implemented um, new rail service in Connecticut is the Harford Line. Um, and that is was implemented originally under the NHHS or New Haven to Harford to Springfield program, which is was and still is a phased program um, that is being implemented incrementally over time. And so as an example, um, and again, this is a different corridor, but the Hartford uh, Line service began uh, with a feasibility study in 1994 and moved through an, uh, environmental assessment, um, design, and construction um, with the initial phases of um, initial operating of the service in 2018. Um, and phases are still being added to the service um, over time. Um, so this serves as um, an example just to kind of illustrate uh, what this process could take. So what's next for the ECRTS study specifically? Uh, well, currently we are in the midst of our public information meetings to present the findings um, and give you a chance also to review the draft final report, which is available um, online, and we are also in the midst of the public comment period, which will end um, October 20th. Um, and then once, after October 20th, once the public comment period ends, we will be looking through all the feedback that we receive and trying to incorporate it to finalize the report and then deliver it to the legislature by November 30th. And as I mentioned, the ECRTS final draft report is available online, it's available on the study website in the document library. Um, the final report is intended to serve as a summary of all of the technical documentation and analysis and feedback that we um, received. As I mentioned, this is a very large comprehensive study. So there are 13 appendices that support this um, summary report. Uh, so we encourage you to read through the report take a look at anything in particular that you're interested in that may be in the appendices, and um, provide comments to us before October 20th. 
Um, you can submit your comments or questions to dotplanning at ct.gov. You can also leave a voicemail at 860-594-2020. And more information is also available on the study website and the URL um, you can see on the slide. And with that, um, we will now uh, enter into the question and answer session. And I'll invite others from the study team um, up front. Um, So I'll, I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves. I'll pass the mic around. Just uh, before we get started, hi, my name is David Elder. I'm one of the managers in the Bureau of Policy and Planning. I know that there are some legislators here, and uh, I just wanted to say if they would like to say a few things or if they have questions at the beginning of, beginning of the question and answer period, please go ahead, raise your hand. We will come out and find you. Right after we do introductions, that's what we'll do. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Rich Jankovic. I'm the Rail Administrator for the Connecticut Department of Transportation. Lisa Rivers, I am the Administrator for the Office of Transit and Ride Sharing. So rubber wheels, steel wheels. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Yuri Kulgis. I'm an Assistant Rail Administrator for the Office of Rail. And I believe So I will hand it over to Representative Nolan, um, who would like to say something to start. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming out and sharing this information. Uh, this is some real priorities for Southeastern Connecticut, um, and we do uh, really feel the need that this is necessary. Um, but my first question is going to be, so if we cannot do it, all at one time, um, and we do do it in phases. Do you have a plan established to choose what phase may be first? Um, and if not, is there a, a guess in how we would come up with that decision? So um, as a feasibility study, we did take a look at a lot of um, potential options, and um, an there was a lot of analysis. Um, I wouldn't say that this study sets a clear path forward in terms of a phasing plan, because in order to do that, um, that would require further study to look at where like equipment could turn around, for example, or be stored um, in the shorter term. Um, but we do, toward the end of the report, in the conclusion, do present a table of um, examples of um, what could be potential phases. For example, I think one of them was um, operating uh, directly straight to Westerly from New London Station. Um, and then the table outlines specifically what further detailed study would be needed if we were to move forward with that in the short term. So we do start to look at phasing options, but not in um, detail at this point, because that would require the more in-depth study to look individually. Thank you. Um, first and foremost, want to thank uh, DOT for coming down. I could see Anna and, uh, and your team, um, and uh, certainly the consultants who've been hard at work um, over the last couple of years now um, working on this plan. Um, most importantly, a big shout out to the community for coming out, a very strong turnout, and I think it sends a strong statement to Hartford that Eastern Connecticut is ready for more connectivity and certainly uh, more rail in our area. Um, also see uh, Senator Summers here as well, and uh, Representative uh, Conley, um, who couldn't make it tonight, sends her regards. Also want to acknowledge we have um, the newly elected state senator from Westerly in the room. And um, it's so critically important that we continue to cultivate relationships across river to river, from the Thames all the way to Pocketuck River, um, because at the end of the day, for this 
project to go get over the finish line, it's going to have to take collaboration with uh, our neighbor to our east. Now for the question. Um, there are certainly a lot of um, projects along our entire coastline uh, um, the, in terms of the shoreline study area from uh, the Thames River all the way to uh, westerly, especially with the um, building of the viaduct. Um, now um, in terms of a connect, um, any um, construction that will be need to be done on the rail lines, uh, what the impacts will be to some of the other uh, DOT projects and how all of the projects um, can, um, can ultimately also connect uh, with the um, uh, potential for uh, shoreline east extension. So let me just clarify rail related projects because again as it was presented this is Amtrak territory we own up to New Haven so currently we have the fitter interlocking project going on right now but it's Amtrak it's their project we contribute to it because it's part of the service uh, that we are sharing with them out there with the Northeast Corridor uh, they are in the process of getting ready to go ahead with their Connecticut River Bridge which is a massive project from old, old Saybrook to New London uh, they finished their bridges east of that on the movable side. So other than that, um, I'm not sure, Yuri, was there any other projects right now that could be impacted uh, if we were to go and do anything out here? Does that answer that, or were you particular on a project that you had in mind? Yes, uh, this is a question posed by a few um, Stonington Borough uh, constituents um, uh, who have been following the viaduct um, uh, replacement uh, very closely in terms of the bridge that carries uh, vehicular and pedestrian traffic um, um, over the railroad, the current the, uh, railroad um, into the borough. Um, that's a, a project that's on the horizon that's going to be um, quite significant and certainly important for obviously um, coordination of, of both projects should um, both projects move forward. To clarify, are you asking about the Alpha Avenue bridge project yes. in Stonington? Okay. I'm not, a, are you aware of that, Yuri? No, go ahead. I, I can't speak to construction, but we um, did coordinate with the design team for the Alpha Avenue Bridge project um, to ensure that it is being designed in a way that um, has the proper clearance and um, width for any potential rail if it were to move forward at that location. Excellent. And uh, lastly, the high-level uh, pl platform boarding, um, obviously important for the M8s. Uh, in Mystic, for example, Amtrak station, um, uh, with the curvature of the rail, um, it, it seems like it may be difficult to accommodate both within that kind of footprint. Uh, has that been uh, exhausted in terms of the research to, uh, in, you know, for having maybe a high-level platform at that current location? Is that feasible? We have looked in depth at that location, and um, we have considered all possibilities, but unfortunately, the existing Mystic Station is located at a substantial curve, um, and there is no way that a high-level platform could be sited at that location, um, which is why we identified the alternative location that we did. Um, which again would be prohibitive to complying with ADA um, requirements as well as operating our MA equipment. Outstanding. I know f folks have a lot of questions here. Um, also uh, want to put in a plug for obviously the infill train station in Groton, um, when, what we consider downtown Groton. Um, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of uh, infill development, uh, really activating that space to get mixed use, um, something we don't really have here in Groton. But again, location is everything, and that really is the most ideal location for that. So look forward to supporting this great project, and thanks, you all, for, thanks all for coming out. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Nice to see everybody. Uh, my name is Heather Summers. I'm the senator from the 18th district, and I want to thank you for being here. I also want to thank Anthony Nolan, and I, I'm not sure that you were in office yet when we funded this project, right? So my question to you is, you know, you have this sort of 50,000 foot feasibility level. After you receive all the public comment that you'll probably get from many of these folks, and there's about 5,000 people that follow uh, what's happening, at least online. I'm sure you're well, um, bring Shoreline East more stops here. 
So once you have all the comments from the individuals, and I'm sure you'll get comments from legislators across the um, Eastern Shoreline, just not from here, but probably from Madison down, and you identify sort of the next steps. Here in particular, I would like to see Shoreline East obviously brought to Westerly in a, a more commuter rail uh, function that, that would, you'd be able to hop on someplace in Madison maybe and come to Mystic. You could get on Mystic and go to Westerly. Um, I think that would really help, number one, with the carbon uh, emissions problems that we have, get cars off the road. Obviously, people are sick of being on 95 in the horrible traffic that we have because there's so many cars. And Mystic is the number one tourist destination, actually, in New, in, in, in New England, number four in the country, especially in the summertime. So could you let us know, as legislators, after you have an opportunity to look at what the next step would be, what do you need for funding? Because we need to start on that now. I sent on appropriations. I am happy to try to fight for you all for the funding that you'll need to go to the next step. Because this funding wasn't easy to get just to do this part. So we're going to need a lot more to get the detail level that we need before we can make a decision on what we're going to do and what we're not going to do, what we can afford and what we cannot afford. I will say, even though it's only 300,000 people that may ride the rail, it's really important to southeastern Connecticut. We're your economic driver for the state of Connecticut with the larger employers. We're the number one tourist destination. We generate a ton of revenue for the state. So don't discount us just because we're not Fairfield County. So I have a challenge for you. And my challenge is put more trains on the line during Arts Festival weekend here in Mystic. I've been asking for this for a long time. I know I've worked with Anne. Put direct, fli di direct flights, direct trains from New York to Mystic with few stops. And we will, if we have an opportunity to market it, you will see we have hundreds of thousands of people that come to Mystic that weekend. We will show you that people will ride the train to our part of Connecticut. You just have to give us an opportunity. You know, if we don't have trains, you can't ride them. So I think it's really important that you get back to us as best that you can. I know we're the temporary staff, and you guys are the permanent staff. Um, so let us know what you need for funding so that we have an opportunity to work with our colleagues to fight for it so this community can have an opportunity like the other end of the state. So thank you. Thank I'm not you. not sure where this goes. It goes to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, Senator Victoria Gu from Westerly and parts of Charleston and South Kingstown. Um, I want to give a shout out to all the Westerly residents who first informed me about Shoreline East. So you want to ra raise your hands. We have, we have a big group here. Thank you so much for everyone for coming out and, um, and for a, a little group organized to try to advocate for rail. And um, when I first heard about it, I was excited because we have such a nice rail station right in downtown Westerly. And I think it's really underutilized for what it is, given the number of trains that currently stop there. Um, you have something that's walking distance to the shops and restaurants and a big tourist draw. And um, I think that the additional rail, s rail service and more frequent rail service will help uh, enormously. And also, just right across from the train station is the Westerly Education Center. So a lot of people from all over the area, Connecticut, Rhode Island, come in get their training in the trades or take college classes and then are able to work at often electric boat in Connecticut or Rhode Island. So there's so, I think transit is about economic opportunity as well as so many other things. Um, the, my second point is just that this presentation is very technical, but the, on the human side of it, I've had a number of people reach out in the last nine months that I've been in office just saying that they're severely limited by the lack of public transit. Uh, one woman had to turn down a job because it was too far away. She didn't have a car. And then there's uh, the Center for People with Disabilities in my area where they try to connect people with jobs, but uh, since they can't drive, uh, they're limited to what's within walking distance. So um, the good news is because of the density, there's a lot of people walking in walking distance to the Westerly train station and could walk there and then you know, get their jobs you know, in Connecticut or Rhode Island. Uh, so I just want to make a plug for uh, Westerly being uh, a next uh, viable and um, a very good location for Shoreline East Extension. And um, I, I wanted to ask just what is the plan for outreach 
in Rhode Island because obviously it's it's it is an infrastructure upgrade and we're definitely wanting to find funding for it uh, obviously within Rhode Island or at the federal level but we also have to build kind of the the why and the how and uh, make sure everyone in Rhode Island also understands why that is necessary. So as the study started our counterpart or my counterpart was Stephen Devine. He has since retired, but we do coordinate with our surrounding states. So in this particular uh, situation, we would do further coordination. But as we mm -hmm. chose the station of Westerly, that was a coordinated effort between mm -hmm. us, the study that we did, as well as with Rhode Island DOT. So okay. right now, I'd leave it at that, that, uh, you know, from, from your perspective, you know, mm -hmm. work with those folks. But we are actually starting quarterly meetings since he is retired and replaced with another individual uh, that I'm working with with my staff. So we're starting our quarterlies actually this coming week. So we'll have conversations okay. about it, but it goes into a much bigger plan, as you can imagine. Yep. Perspective-wise. Definitely. Yeah. Happy to help with that. Yeah. Thank no you. problem. I'm Frank Boland. I'm a citizen of Groton. Um, remembering that the, um, the last UN alert gave us something like six or seven years to uh, reduce our carbon dioxide levels to something that might allow us to keep our temperature increases to less than two degrees centigrade. Remembering that um, from all indications, the uh, traffic in and to the submarine base and electric boat is going to do nothing but increase over the next five years or so as the second class submarine comes on and the number of hires goes up, according to the newspaper anyway. Uh, you took my breath away with the time that it took to get the, what was it, the Hartford? extension uh, uh, permitted and operational, something in excess of 25 years. Um, to carry on Senator Summers' challenge, I think that represents a significant challenge to you, given the time that we have. Do you see any way that we're going to be, or any way that we could, reduce the time that it takes to get some of these projects operational? It would seem to me, to go to the question of priorities, that uh, you know, this, the simple Yank, with a few million dollars in his pocket, uh, could uh, extend the service to Westerly tomorrow afternoon, one, w once a day. Anyway, um, got to buy some service and I got to pay for some staff. So priorities may be something that would help us reduce the time. But the question is, do you see any way that we as citizens to call to our politicians, to call to our scientists, might be able to reduce the time that it seems to be necessary to get these things permanent? Um, so the Hartford line, um, you are correct. It did take about 25 years to begin um, implementing service. Um, that was specific to that that particular program and service, um, there were different factors at play. Um, I wouldn't. I think there were also some um, pauses in that timeline as well, um, due to funding. I, I think you know a lot of it depends on funding. Um, it depends on also um, some of the constraints. For example, we can't operate tomorrow because we don't own either rail right of way. Um, so that would require us working through an agreements process with the current owners um, and then also then working through an agreements process to um, secure an operator. So um, there are many factors at play that would still require us to go through um, the full project lifecycle process that FTA and FRA put forth. Um, that being said, that doesn't mean it's going to necessarily take 25 years like the Hartford line did. Um, as you said, depending on, um, you know, if we get funding and 
um, you know, other factors align. Yes, hi. Um, <clears throat> I'm a Stonington resident, and I clearly remember, as people in this room may remember, that there was a proposal by the Federal Railroad Administration Tier 1 proposal back in 2017 that if you were a Stonington or Mystic resident, probably scared you to death because the plan was to increase speed from Washington to Boston, putting rail lines through Mystic Village, Mystic Aquarium, Elmridge Golf Course, then turning north. So part of the argument for not fulfilling that plan um, was that climate change was going to impact, or part of the argument for that plan was that climate change was going to put many of the rail lines that are along the river underwater. I see that this plan piggybacks Amtrak uh, shoreline east along the ocean uh, and Long Island Sound. So my question is probably to Amtrak, what happens in the next 10 years when um, the low railroad lines along Long Island Sound and the Mystic River will be underwater, according to many predictions and an argument that was used for that tier one plan. Has that been considered? Who will pay for that when changes have to be made to that line due to rising seawater and river water? All right, <laughs> but decided to decide which, which order. <laughs> that was a multi-part question, <laughs> so we're trying to make sure that we covered all of the parts. Uh, so I think that one part of the solution um, or of, of the strategies that we talked about uh, today associated with um, sea level rise and the location of the, the, the rail corridors, uh, we'll talk about in, in a second, but one um, of the um, strategies that we talked about today are the, the shorter term strategies associated with transit service uh, solutions, which are more flexible um, and also um, operating um, in, in areas along uh, roadways uh, that are, are less susceptible, uh, but would also potentially have some, um, some uh, needs uh, associated with climate change. Uh, so those transit service strategies are ones that are much more flexible uh, and can provide a, you know, a similar level of service in order to get folks out of their um, personal vehicles and on, on to transit strategies. And if you want to talk about the rail levels. <laughs> I can talk a little bit because, again, as we presented tonight, this is Amtrak property out here, Amtrak territory. They are building a $1.2 billion bridge in Old Saybrook Old Line. That's what it's going to cost as of today when they get done with it. So they would probably do the best about answering your question how in 10 years if it's going to raise that much but they've built are going to build that bridge they built the Niantic bridge as well as the new London bridge with a much longer horizon so I'm not going to challenge the rise and the change in the sea level at all but I would direct these concerns because that's their property out this is their property all the way from New Haven out we're out there on a an access agreement actually through our operating agreement to be on the property. So I think I'd like to leave it with that because they are making investments with federal dollars and some state dollars, but mostly federal dollars in large capital in the anticipation of the future needs as well as the conditions they foresee. Oh, hi. Um, I'm, I'm Liz Ray's back, and I live in Groton. I have a statement to share with you, which pretty much echoes everything our legislator said, uh, which I totally agree with. I'm co-chair of Groton Conservation Advocates. My question for you is, why did you decide not to study 
the loop that connects Pfizer electric boat and the Navy, which would then be connected to the shoreline um, rail line and um, provide great access to our major employers. Thank you. So, so I believe what you're referring to is what we called the Groton Secondary Corridor. Um, and we, we did study it in the initial phases of the study. Um, but as we entered the preliminary feasibility assessment, which included the corridor capacity analysis, um, that identified not just the, there were limitations due to the Thames River movable bridge and what, how long the bridge could be um, down for, but also um, we looked at Amtrak's existing as well as planned service expansions. And so with those two factors, we were only then going to be able to potentially operate one train across the bridge in each direction per hour. So we could have either chosen to do that, that operation for the east side of the Thames River, the Groton Secondary, or the Northeast Corridor Extension, but we wouldn't be able to do more than one of those corridors. So we considered all three and felt that proceeding the further more detailed analysis with the section along the NEC um, better served a greater population and their transportation needs. However, we did still consider looking at the transportation needs. As you mentioned, there are a lot of major employers in that area that you're referring to in Groton, and we do recognize that and recognize that they would need a connection to the main line. So what we've proposed in our transit strategies is a demand response service, which is essentially microtransit that responds um, and greater flexibility to the needs of what would be the commuting population in that area. Um, and so for a lower cost as well as, um, as, well as um, easier implementation, we could better meet the needs of the commuting population in that specific area of Groton. Um, so that is how we handled that area. Good evening. First of all, my name is Michael Pastor. I'm the mayor of New London. Uh, first, I want to thank you for your work on this, and I want to thank the legislators for uh, funding this study, a very crucial first step. Um, I have to share uh, Mr. Boland's, was it Mr. Boland's uh, point, uh, and I think many of you might agree with me that we have a lot more track behind us than we do in front of us. So the timetables did also take my breath away. Um, I go back 10 years, maybe 12 years, to the One More Stop uh, campaign in New London, which got Shoreline East from Saybrook to New London. And at the time, that was, there were insurmountable hurdles, we were told, that was not going to allow that to happen. Somehow, with some grassroots um, motivation, the state managed to get it done. And we were beginning to prove that we could be successful. And uh, we could have support commuter rail in southeastern Connecticut. My law office is in Milford, and I lived the blessed life of traveling uh, Metro North and understanding the benefits that a commuter rail line provides to all aspects of the communities along that rail line. And the towns and the cities in eastern Connecticut deserve that kind of service as well. I understand the challenges, I understand the ownership of the track, the, the bridges, um, the boat lobbies, and uh, the federal laws on navigation. Uh, but I think we have, to, we have to take that strategy that brought us Shoreline East to New London and start to move now with some phases that are not going to take 10, 15, or 25 years because we need the relief now. EB has, at last count, over 40 billion dollars worth of contracts. At the beginning of the year, their goal was to hire 5,000 new employees. I don't know how they're doing on that. Um, a little skeptical, but if there was commuter rail service, uh, 
along the shoreline, then it would open up those job opportunities for people all the way to New Haven and beyond, and from westerly and beyond. And I think we're cheating the economy here by not recognizing that I-95 does not serve our interests anymore. New London's growing. So I'm just going to give you my one question because it's a real mystery to me. At least it doesn't seem to apply to New London, but economically we're booming. Jobs were booming. I just told you that EB is hiring 5,000 more. So I'm not sure about your finding that um, there's slow job growth and slow um, population growth. We can't, the only thing slowing down uh, the growth in New London right now is the amount of time it takes to design, permit, and build the buildings. Um, and as soon as a new 200 unit building opens up, it's full within weeks. And, and that's not an exaggeration. There's waiting lists. As soon as people read about a planned uh, development, and we have a number of them, the waiting lists start to, uh, to, uh, to uh, rent those apartments. And uh, these folks uh, um, really need commuter rail service. So, uh, but that, that's my question anyway. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you very much for uh, for joining us tonight and for your question and your and your statement. Um, as far as the the um, uh, the uh, the numbers of uh, job loss and job change over time, those are historic numbers. So we're looking at historic numbers. We also looked at projections moving forward. So we were trying to understand, looking back as part of the transit-oriented development potential area, where there were uh, where there were gaps or perhaps limitations in economic development in this region caused by XYZ, including job loss and change. We did also, looking forward, um, so those, those numbers were looking historically, we did also look forward, we talked with EB, we talked with Pfizer, we talked with 20 different um, target uh, um, uh, institutions as well as activity uh, centers, uh, universities as well as um, recreational um, facilities uh, and, and whatnot, and we're able to identify their uh, potentials for job growth as well as housing and development patterns. We requested and received development um, plans from each of the communities uh, within the region, and we included those in our analysis to look at the potential feasibility for, for service um, into the future. So we did meet with EB. Hi, remember, I'm the bus lady. So um, we met with them. We talked about what they perceived their demands were going to be. We identified park and ride lots. So I have a 350 uh, vehicle park and ride lot up in Colchester. I have park and ride lots all across the state. So I can get express buses in there, and you can have your folks park up there. We'll express you down. Um, but we have heard nothing back. So from what I believe is that the I, I'm just, you know, we, we had a possible solution for them and we haven't heard anything from them since. It's been quite a while. Hi. Hello. I'm not sure how to get to John. John Sutherland, a uh, resident of Croton. Um, one of the things that concerned me was the uh, statement about the uh, constraint uh, with the uh, bridge uh, across the river at New London. And in my life, I've, I don't deal well with constraints. Maybe I'm crazy, but I just don't <laughs> like that sort of thing. What, what, would, how, what difference would it make if the constraint of the bridge was removed, which it could be easily done with a tunnel? It wouldn't be cheap, but it would, it would work. Was that ever taken into consideration? Thanks. Uh, thank you um, for your for your question and your statement. Um, for uh, the um, for the Thames River movable bridge um, and the corridor capacity analysis, we looked at all different types of options, uh, engineering solutions, new bridge, 
tunnel, uh, working with the Coast Guard Academy to change their policy for the amount of time that the bridge could be open. Uh, we, we did uh, talk through and look through and analyze um, all of those options as part of the corridor capacity analysis. Um, one of the other big things that contributing to the constraint in, in addition to the um, in, in addition to the movable bridge and the, and the opening and closing policies uh, associated with it is actually the, the number of Amtrak trains uh, who are running along their own rail line <laughs> in that area. Uh, so the number of trains per hour that they are running now and are considering running uh, in the future is, is substantial. It's quite an increase. Uh, so um, they're, they're, um, the organization of the opening and closing and the organization of being able to schedule the trains uh, to fit in those slots uh, is, is challenging. Uh, so yes, we did consider uh, those things uh, for a lot of money. Um, there are potential, but again, for a lot of money. <laughs> I'll just add um, to that, that um, in, in considering also different potential options. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about timeline. And so funding for these options and, um, um, you know, complexity also factors into the timeline. So using kind of existing infrastructure, um, while it has constraints, maybe less constraints than other alternatives. Hi. Is this work? Yeah, it's work. It's working. My name is Dan Brewer. I'm from Stonington. I'm retired. I'm a train addict. I'm this close to a 12-step program. I've got good news for you guys. Um, this concern about the bridge. Nothing's written in stone. Things can be negotiated. It's been done. All, when you consider the amount of traffic that's going on over bridges, from New Haven on in, we can do this. This bridge is not an obstacle. Another piece of good news, back in the 60s when the New Haven was bleeding cash and had to be put into Penn Central, there's one passenger service that was still making money and that was the route from New London up to Worcester. So that route's gonna make some money. People are gonna wanna get back on it. Another thing, I think we can think of juggle two balls at once. The Rhode Island T, they're very nice people. And if we can get them to come down to Westerly, we can, we can take more cars off the highway to go to TF Green Airport. Thank you. I'm Ed Johnson. From, I'm a resident of Groton. I'll stick with one small topic. It's easier to deal with. Uh, following up on Senator Summers' comments about Mystic. Um, there's a modification that needs to be made to the Mystic Station proposal. Uh, for those of you who have this sheet in front of you, it's on page two at the bottom. It's referred to as the Mystic Alternative, the Alternative Station. Current plan um, is a new rail station on a straight track section in a marsh area east of the existing railroad station, which is too far to walk downtown. You're gonna try and get people from Boston, New York, whatever, Westwood, they're not gonna walk that kind of a distance. So you're not solving the problem. It makes the train service less accessible to Mystic. However, there is another straight track section just west of the Mystic station towards the Mystic River Railroad Bridge. I think Amtrak owns it. This includes a large open area which could be used for parking and a very easy walk to downtown, even closer to the, than the existing station is. Please consider this important modification. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your statement. Uh, we are, uh, we did look into that alternative uh, location as well, and we'll consider uh, 
other, other options. And of course, um, either way, given the distance between um, downtown Mystic as well as the Mystic uh, Aquarium and the old Mystic Village, a, sh a shuttle or rubber tired solution uh, would be needed regardless in order to connect the triangle uh, that, is, that is Mystic. Uh, so some of that could be, um, uh, could be solved with some trolley or shuttle type or uh, rubber tired type uh, solutions uh, in the future in order to make those connections, which would be, of course, required to make those mobility connections in Mystic. Hi there. Hello. My name is Paul Avery. I'm a resident of a homeowner in Stonington. I know there's, a, there's really a lot of zeal for expanding the corridor north but we talk about environmental impact and everybody's up about getting rid of greenhouse gases but let's talk about the environmental impact of everybody who lives along the train tracks uh, especially there in Stonington where, near where I live there are a few crossings that are it's horrendous right now with the train whistles and now I hear that Amtrak wants to expand uh, their service it's unbelievable to have these trains come through and wail on their whistles. It's a, it's a minute long process, so you figure you have seven or eight trains an hour. Maybe they're going to add more. You guys want to add an hour, uh, I guess two ways or so, add two more, yet more trains. Are you going to be blowing your whistle now at the two crossings that are right near my house? I mean, that's a question, because I know there's a lot of, I'd like to meet a lot of the politicians in this room and see what they might be able to do. There's been a lot of lip service over the years to get rid of, the, to create a, a quiet zone. I know there's you know, federal regulations up the wazoo about having to blow these damn whistles. I, I mean, I was gonna bring a, I have some videos, add insult to injury. They're already blowing these whistles even though the train's halfway through the, these, these crossings. There's one crossing called Walker's Dock. There's one 100 yards away called Freeman's Island. So I don't know. If any talk has been given about um, quieting this, this, this feature along the tracks and, you know, by me and up and down the, the train line, because it's, it's an issue. And it's all great, well and good. You want to increase traffic, you want to add this commuter line, but what about the environment, environmental impact on us? You know, the, it's, it's a degradation of our peace and quiet and tranquility to have this thing go off. I mean, I have a video here I could show you. I, I wish I had brought a, uh, an air horn to give you an idea of what it's like hearing this thing go off all the time. It's 120 decibels. I, I measured it today. My house, 100 yards away, it's 85 decibels. And so I, I really wonder if, you know, if any thought, any discussion has been worked into your feasibility plan as we go forward with this to address because I know, like in Stonington, we have a quiet zone. You're gonna, is that quiet zone going to go away? Because you're going to start bringing your trains in, put in a train track, and put, put in a station. So anyway, I'm all for progress here, but there has to be consideration for those who are living near the tracks and the, the increase of traffic that you're proposing. Thank you. Sure. Um, I'll start by talking about the study. Um, so since this is a feasibility study, again, this is a preliminary step. We're looking at just the feasibility of if this service could be technically feasible, if there's a market for it. Um, we would, if we were to move through the project life cycle process, we would have to do um, an environmental impact study. We would have to do a lot more further analysis to look at the immediate areas around the rail service and the stations to see what all of those sort of community impacts would be and um, identify mitigation strategies. So we're not at that point in this study right now. Um, and I'll turn it over to Rich who can talk a little bit more probably about quiet zones. So I'll talk about crossings and, and I do feel for what you're saying because I live up off of about a half a mile from the Berlin, so it's the Harford line. Those regulations about at crossings are coming from FRA, but I'm gonna give you what happened just in my little town just three months ago. An individual was up on that railroad and he was killed, not even a half a mile from my house. 
the first thoughts went to my mind was, was it a neighbor? They do that for a reason. I know that's very uncomfortable for you folks that are across it because we deal with this up and down on the New Haven line, the Hartford line, and obviously out here. I do want to say I feel that you, know, you want it to be lesser decibels. We looked into those. Um, from our perspective, again, I'm not saying theirs being Amtrak because this is Amtrak property, but these trains out here, as you know, are very quiet. So they move, and they move faster. This individual. I'm talking about the Amtrak equipment, yeah. and I'm talking about the Acela that's coming, right? So that's 90 mile an hour territory out there. So that moves. I've been on the platforms. I'm always out with my team all the time. So I can say we can pass these concerns on. We can work with you to try to work with Amtrak about their crossings. But what I saw just in my little neighborhood up in Berlin where someone was on the tracks, and that's a lost family member because they just had earbuds on and it wasn't suicide. He just thought he could walk on the railroad. And so they were blowing the horn, blowing the horn, blowing the horn. So when you hear these horns at crossings and we talk about quiet zones and implementing quiet zones, but there's also a lot of data and we work with the FRA with this in Connecticut and they work it in the region and around the country. That's the way that they try to at least alert people People run these. I've seen it up on the Harford line. They run with cars through them. If it wasn't for all the fatalities that rack up, but I'll just tell you what I saw and what I felt personally in my own town. And I saw a lot of people come out, flowers and everything, but I went up there because I was worried that it was one of our neighborhood's kids. We didn't know who it was. So again, we understand that. We try to work with the FRA and we try to work because what also happens with a lot of these crossings, you have different engineers, right? They're all trained. They all have the same training, but they may hit it a little longer or a little. Yeah, so I, I do understand it. Those two crossings are, you have over a half a mile line of sight each way. And, and so it's just, it's, it's so maddening and, and it's disheartening to hear that there's going to be yet more traffic uh, um, by Amtrak. And anyway, if any politicians here in the room, people like you could have any effect on that, uh, any impact, that would be so, just not me personally, but the three, 400 people who live in the area. Now, we can definitely pass that along because we work very closely with Amtrak. Even though we say it's their property, we work with them every day. Yuri from the construction side and the engineering and the capital side, but just on both sides of our house, what I call in, in the rail end, uh, with the operators uh, being them uh, in the transportation, we can pass that along because we've had that complaint up on the New Haven line on New Canaan where a lot of people just, because you've got technology now, you can just video it yourself and you could see difference of how certain engineers, and then that information gets passed back. We pass that back. What they'll do is pass it back, and then they'll try to do some spot inspections to see if engineers are doing it more than what's required. Because again, they're following re you know, requirements by them. But, but I do feel for you, because when you said 120 decibels, that's a little louder than it. I'm thinking, because I think it's 102, it should be the decibel level. Yeah, yep. Yep, no, Yuri, did you want to add anything to the quiet zones or are you good? You're good, okay. Hello? Yeah. Uh, hi, Robert Siegel, a uh, new neighbor of yours in Groton City at the north end. I'd like to suggest something to uh, attach this to, to connect to, because um, I, I love my little town. Um, it's a little, 
It's been described by its own town council, I think is blighted in the middle. Um, it's kind of acres of parking lots and a big shipyard. Uh, I work for EB. I would like to see a light rail system connect into the Groton Station and circulate around, reach the shipyard, come up along Thames Street and reach King's Highway with a large parking garage at King's Highway so that people could commute in and then be shuttled down this to the shipyard. Um, this would dovetail with the, uh, the CT rail uh, extension. Uh, I'm also, uh, I'd like to uh, toss out the thought that maybe in kind of in the flavor of the hybrid proposal uh, for uh, north to uh, Norwich, that a similar thing could be run between the Groton Station, especially if it were over uh, closer to the river and westerly, that trains need not cross the movable bridge if they shuttle back and forth on both sides of it and then only cross occasionally. members and he's here and I'm sure he has something to say so sorry if I'm um, cutting other people thank you um, thank you um, I'm uh, what's referred to as the uh, project champion and um, that's not always PC because uh, I'm something of a uh, thorn in the side of my colleagues up here on the, on the front front table um, a couple things I wanted to uh, sort of um, maybe help uh, explain uh, because a number of people have already brought it up and I had worked up um, some graphics and I just want to show you what I think may be possible uh, on and then I'll go back and talk about some general um, matters. Um, um, the first is um, the situation, the first is the situation at the Mystic um, uh, Station. Mystic Station, uh, and, and this is a map, I have to confess, was done for another purpose. It was done because of flood conditions in Mystic. But the Mystic Station is located over here in Stonington. And you can see it is on a clear curve. And it makes it virtually impossible with the current technology to have a high platform and to get uh, people on and off a train in an ADA uh, compliance sort of way. And so um, what happened, um, and I was not involved with this part, um, the uh, team, study team, basically decided that this was not possible here. They should move the station out um, west or east of the uh, road that goes out uh, to um, Mason's Island, going out this way into uh, this nice swamp over here. Now I say nice swamp, I say that uh, very uh, um, uh, jokingly because it does flood regularly. Uh, for those people who run down uh, Route 1 and you get a big rainstorm, uh, this street right here, uh, which is in the 100 year floodplain by the way, uh, does fill up and it's full of water. So, um, and, and I look, there's only a very small section here while the, the, the rails are straight here, um, you've got topography and wetlands that really makes that a very difficult site uh, to actually construct. Uh, there's been a big hula over the, 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 the um, uh, already the work that's been done there in Stonington and the work's come to a stop. Well, when we started to look at this thing and uh, my colleague Ed uh, Johnson and I um, um, tend to go look at these sites, we went back and looked at, um, starting at the uh, the station here, Hoxie Fire Department, and went around here to where the rail crossing is here in the Mystic River. And you'll notice this is where the old bridge was on the north side. The new bridge is here, but there is a section from here to here that's well over um, 800 feet in length. And it seems to, at least to Ed and myself, this provides a potential opportunity to put one, a high 
platform there um, and uh, provide parking. And it still connects to, although you have to walk, uh, to the uh, current station. And if you look at this and you take the radius, and I'm going to do this by, um, well, my hand's not quite big enough, but if I take a half mile radius and swing it like this around there, it uh, basically allows people to walk in that half mile to many of the key elements that um, Senator, Hummer, uh, Senator um, uh, Summers brought up and others with the tremendous activity that takes place in the center of Groton. It also, by having the station here the continued, you have access going up both to the seaport up here, to the aquarium up above it, where all the hotels are, and then finally the mystic, um, the old mystic village. And so um, I would hope that um, this might be considered as a, a real possibility, um, because it seems to me that, um, yes, it's in the 100-year floodplain, but what the point here, and I think the point that um, has been made, is that we are going to experience 20 inches of sea level rise in this area right here, 20 inches by 2050. And that is, means that these projects are going to have a limited life. No matter how you, no matter how you do it, because you can't afford to build a dike around the entire southeastern Connecticut. You just can't do it. There's not enough money. You think a billion dollars for this project is a lot of money? A dike would really be expensive. So what this does, by doing something like this, this takes advantage of what's already in the ground and uses it for the next 25 years effectively. And it's the use of this resource already in the ground that I think is important. Now, I understand there's going to be complications with, oh dear, what is Amtrak going to do? Because they like to open their ramps and let people go on and off there. They might be able to use this ramp over here at a high level f for um, their passengers. So that's the first thing that I sort of wanted to show you all, that when you actually take a look at this thing and blow these kinds of pieces of information up, you actually have a little different view of what might be possible. Now the second issue that was brought up earlier, and, and I do have to credit this to my wife, she wanted to know about the Groton Secondary. Now this is, um, for those, uh, and you're going to have a hard time seeing it in the back of the room, New London, Groton, this line through here is the NEC, the Amtrak line. The Groton Secondary is this rail that starts in this area right here where electric boat is, runs around, goes through, literally through the building at Pfizer's, comes around, goes across Birch Plain Creek, comes up, and then it has a choice. It either can go east, parallel to NEC, or it can go west, parallel to NEC. And I would point out that, and I think uh, certainly the rail people know this, that up at this point, you either can go north, or you can go straight ahead uh, to New London. Now, if this is a real, a real constraint, and I would argue, having spent my good part of my career in the regulatory world at the federal level, having worked with, and it's, by the way, not the, the, the Coast Guard Academy, it's with the U.S. Coast Guard that actually does this. Um, these are always negotiable. Always negotiable. And they are on a regular basis. But, Assuming, assuming we have this constraint right here, consider this. Supposing we have a shuttle that is going around and goes to here and comes to, and this circle is where the so-called Groton West site has been proposed. So Joe Welder gets out of work, comes around here, and he actually lives in Stonington. He gets off at Groton West and picks up the normal, the normal shoreline east going to westerly. He never crosses the river. Now, the, the other advantage of this is that if you come up here and um, it happens to be 
now not Joe Welder, but Sailor Ed, who is working with the submarine base, he potentially can take the, the shuttle around here, go up here, and instead of going across the river, he can go up here to the south end of the submarine base. Potentially, he could go all the way through, presumably that this could be figured out with the security at the base. And what we've been already told is the sub-base, given the right set of circumstances, could make that available. That's in writing. It's part of the record. And so you could go up, essentially, the east side of the river um, on what's referred to as the old Norwich line. And I simply want to make this a point here uh, because um, I think it's important. Now, the question was, okay, so how does this get people, if you use the east side, to New London? Well, you don't have to come down this rail line and take the switch and go straight across. You can come down, take the switch, stop here at Groton West, pick up the train going the other way, and this is only, by the way, um, something less than a half, three quarters of a mile, I guess, there. Um, and so you could then go to, to New London as well. Now, I realize this is some nuances compared to the feasibility level, high level study. But what I would like not to see happen is that we preclude options when you have these kinds of alternatives that potentially um, can be can can be considered um, to take advantage of using what's already here. Now, yes, you can use buses and microbuses and go from here down the street, and then you get into this nice mess here, traffic here. Or if you come down this way, you get into traffic here. So you have an option here which potentially uses rail, although it could use microtransit. Now, one of the other things that you, there's virtually no discussion in the study at this point is that we have a university down here called Avery Point. And last time I checked, there are no students who live there, and there are no faculty who live there. People commute down here. And wouldn't it be nice if these people could take a train here and pick up a, a shuttle, a, a bus shuttle, and go down here to Avery Point on a regular basis. It just seems to me to be one of those options that needs to be considered as we put together uh, this whole package. Now, uh, I've probably talked too long, um, and um, maybe some of the other folks in there, uh, the, the team might want to uh, address some of this. Um, but let me... Well, let me say, it's, 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 I think, crystal clear in the 71 or 73 page report that feasibility is possible. How we do it is going to be critical. And it looks like some of the stuff is pretty straightforward. Running from New London to Westerly, I think, can be done rather rapidly. Now, Yes, you have to go through all of the uh, evaluations uh, that are the federal, but I also note in those regulations, there's always the option for exceptions and for changes in the rules. And some of the constraints that we've placed on, the, on how we do rail in Connecticut, we have had some numbers that, for example, we have to have a 500-foot straight platform. Why is that? It's because we run four-car train sets, and yet, the traffic coming to New London right now doesn't de justify having four train sets. It's probably more like two train sets, given the particular ridership that we have right currently. And so there's the kind of thing that I think we need to look at. Now, yes, we have to have the ADA compliant, and just, just so happens we happen to have M8 equipment, and the M8 equipment is not set up to be able to get ADA people on board, and so you have to deal with it. Now, one of the other constraints that you'll see in the report, if you look carefully back into the, in, into the, into the documents, you'll see that um, the Connecticut uh, 
uh, transportation department or rail folks, or I, I'm not sure actually who it is, but it's somebody in transportation who says, well, if we're going to have a new station, we ought to have at least a minimum of 200 car parking lot. The whole point here is to get people out of their cars. And getting for the first mile and the last mile without a car is one of the goals. I think that's very important. So in the mystic situation, why do we need to have 200 parking spaces there? An electric boat and, and, and Pfizer, they already have a huge parking space there. And the report says they need, se they're, they're in a, the number is 1,700, a deficit of 1,700. Well, do we put parking, parking, parking spaces there, or do we make or get people to start using their bikes and walking to and from work? So these are some of the thoughts I have. I'd like to say that I think the study um, clearly demonstrates um, what was designed to do that is feasible. The details going forward are going to be the difficult part of this thing. How this gets phased, clearly buses are going to be important. Buses are poorly understood in eastern Connecticut. Um, and I might say, I think, at the state level. But they're poorly understood in terms of how they can be served. But it's the linking the buses to the trains that ends up being a powerful argument. And finally, the whole, I guess, why would you do this? Why would you do, why would you have this extension? Well, I would argue that the key issue is it's because it's about economic development now and in the future. If we open this system up so people can come here and go easily, then we are making a difference in what's going to happen. Because I can tell you that at the federal level, they've got a huge amount of money that they are desperate to get out to states to improve their rail systems. And if we don't take it, some other state's going to, which is going to make them more competitive than Connecticut. The second reason is about climate change. Greenhouse gas emissions from automobiles and trucks account for 40% of our greenhouse gas load in Connecticut. Buses and trains, in particular electric trains, can reduce that dramatically. But the trains have got to be frequent, they've got to be reliable, and they've got to get to people where they, where they need to go. And so with that, I'd like to thank you all for coming down um, and talking with us about the feasibility study. And um, I'm sure we'll have further conversations. Thank you very much, Zell. Um, as mentioned, Zell is the project, has been the project champion, and he is a valued member of the study steering committee. Um, if anyone has. Um, Again, we are in the public comment period until October 20th, so if anyone has any specific thoughts and details, you know, you are welcome to email it to dotplanning at ct.gov, um, and we will look through and consider and incorporate, again, your thoughts on any specific details um, as we finalize the report. I do want to get to other questions. Um, At least if, if I could, just sure. if uh, people have questions, we are going to the top of the hour. I'd like to just start a list so we can uh, just leave your hand up. I'll come around, and I'm going to write down your name. All right. Uh, thank you. For, and there are two more meetings. There's one tomorrow at Norwich Otis Library at 1 p.m. And there's a virtual public meeting tomorrow night. But just leave your hands up, and I will be around to get you. Uh, Drew, I think you are next, please. Good evening. I'm a uh, Ledger resident. Uh, I understand that the proposal is for a western side of the Thames River, and we are looking at increasing bus traffic on the other side to kind of compensate for the lack of an east side equivalent. Um, my concern is that Route 12, as it stands, is grossly overpopulated. And it's gotten to the point where three times in the last year, our kids who have schools right on Route 12, being the elementary school and the middle school, have not gotten home until almost 6 o'clock at night because the traffic has been so bad. Mm -hmm. It's actually faster to walk. Mm -hmm the five miles to the school than it is to try to get them home by bus. Um, has there been any portion of this study that looks at the effect of that particular region uh, and what this will do to it? Um, so yes, um, as you mentioned, we have then considered transit um, strategies along 
um, both the west as well as the east side of the Thames River. And to your point, um, Route 12 is a major corridor and heavily trafficked, especially during rush hour. Um, we are, so the transit strategies include um, what we kind of consider a BRT or bus rapid transit light um, solution along Route 12. And so what that would look like is essentially it would be an on-street um, operating bus, but we would put in uh, inf infrastructure improvements such as um, transit signal priority, um, queue jumping that would allow um, the buses to move through the corridor uh, much faster. And also by offering that as a solution, um, it offers an alternative to the vehicular traffic and traveling in a single occupancy vehicle. So if people see that as an attractive solution, they may be less likely to take their cars and having that type of a transit solution could hopefully alleviate the, the vehicular traffic. To that end, is there going to be some advertising of that as this project moves forward? As was mentioned, buses are underutilized in this area, and it would be nice to get that information out there so people would actually use them. Um, so, so we have um, presented that as a benefit um, with the transit solutions in the report. Um, in addition to that, um, there are, uh, in the biennial budget, there are transit enhancements budgeted in um, for the seat district. We are also presenting um, to the seat uh, board um, members next month um, to put these, uh, these strategies, um, uh, make them aware of it more directly as well. Hi, uh, Lauren Gauthier. I'm a Groton resident. I'm an RTM member, District 4. Uh, so that's actually the sub-base kind of area, Navy housing. And something that came to mind when you were talking about the demographic background, and then you started stating statistics, I think 159,000 riders potentially. When you came to this number, what did you consider in terms of a cost per ride, and how did you bounce that against our median income? and? You know, if, if we're talking about feasibility, it's not only where we're going to locate stations, but also the feasibility of families, right? If it's not feasible for my family to ditch our car or supplement our transportation, we're not going to do it, right? So I don't want to spin our wheels, pun intended. Okay, well, um, I can give you some background on some work that we're doing on, on the bus side right now. We're looking at a uniform uh, fare program because each district has their own fares. We're looking at taking, once we can develop uniform fares, we can develop uniform fare media, a way of paying it. Um, and we also have a SMART grant that actually somebody who would have been at some of these meetings is in Washington attending a first meeting on it. And that's looking at um, using technology to assist unbanked populations um, with getting access to like a, a smartphone and an account. Um, and one of the things that, that happens, um, we, we get a lot of requests for free service on the bus side um, all the time. A lot of needy populations out there. Um, but rather than having a kind of a, a blanket um, option of free fares for um, all veterans, free fares for people with disabilities, whatever that might be. You look at doing something that can make a more equitable fare system for the riders. So who can afford to pay and who cannot? So you do something called means testing and we can do that with our social service agencies. But that's a much you know, broader proposition to, to undertake. Um, Um, hi, my name is Portia Bordelon. I'm a Groton Town Councilor, born and raised here, grew up in Mystic on High Street, and live in the city side currently, and been serving as an elected official for roughly about seven years now in some capacity. 
Um, raised two, two boys here, um, and over and over as a person who grew up here working downtown Mystic, and now with a son who's 20 serving on the USS uh, Virginia um, station here at Groton, I really am entrenched in the, the lifestyle. Also, we were a military family with his father serving 20 years in the Navy but also being local. So sometimes I feel like I bring that local spin, but also entrenched in that military side and local side of Mystic before the economic development got to be where it is. Um, we cannot grow without a plan, right? Economic development, people thrived and wanted, and now we're stuck with, what do we do? Our highways are two lane. I can't even get to Guilford to my oncologist's office. It used to take me 40 minutes, now it takes me an hour and 10, hour and 15 the traffic. So this alternative that Zell has worked so hard as well as this group in studying it, I just wanted to thank all of you as well as the state reps for you know agreeing to fund this and study this. The Navy, what I hear often, you know, the guys come to my house to eat and they're like, ah, oh, this place has got no 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 way to get there from here or anywhere. There's no bus that comes out in front of the Navy base to get them downtown Mystic or to Westerly or to Providence or to New London to catch the train over there. We need the rail system, but in the meantime, we need a plan to get the rubber on the road to decrease the amount of rubber that's moving around currently. So I see your proposal plan, which I can appreciate, but what can we do immediately to alleviate some of this? For example, I live in the city of Groton. I'm proud to be a city resident, um, but I also love to indulge in the festivities of Mystic. I'd love to be able to hop on a bus somewhere in Groton, leave a car, and get into downtown Mystic, which right now there's a huge uh, issue with traffic and parking going on. This would alleviate that immediately. I don't know that the bus should go downtown Mystic, but maybe drop, out, drop off on the outskirts, and on the outskirts of Stonington. I'm all for the rail, and I think that's exactly what we need to do, but I can't even get anywhere on a bus right now. And then I look at the social economical side. There are people who have reached out to me as an elected official that live in the, what is considered a, maybe a lower dense, uh, lower income sector of town. Unfortunately, low income housing was all clustered together and it wasn't divided, um, the old model, so we still have that structure. And with the change of racial, um, making sure their numbers look good, they're, they're busing kids all around the district and they offered the magnet program. A family that might be low income, who their child misses the bus, they can't get them from the city side up to the other north quarter for an inexpensive cost of either Uber or taxi. Um, the bus system sometimes doesn't come frequent enough by the time they can get them on, school's over or it's midday. So my hope is to see um, and thank Zell for what he's doing and I fully support also what his wife brought up um, in the city side. Every day I see the emissions leaving, sitting in traffic, I can't get through. We need a way to get people into work as well as the people who are working on the Navy base, as well as the people coming into the community, a way to get to Mystic and spend their liquid cash or their, their, their money, but they can't get there. And so I'm hoping as we come up with this plan, we start to utilize the bus system and really advertise it and make it youth and, and user friendly um, so that folks like myself could jump on and know the routes and have them be more frequent and have them go into the evening so that you can go to dinner in Mystic and leave on the rail, uh, on, the, on the bus at 10 o'clock and get back to the other side of Groton. Also, I heard from a, a, a constituent, there used to be a bus that used to run from Mystic, and she's 97, from Mystic downtown Westerly where she'd go to the Knickerbocker and go dancing. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you, you can't do that anymore. We can't even get to Westerly. I spent a lot of time in Westerly. When I'm downtown Mystic, I hear people say, hey, can I catch a bus to go to the beach from here? And I'm like, no, I wish you could. You know, so they're driving. All that admissions that we keep talking about. So again, I know the rail system, I'm, 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 I fully support this study and I, and I look to see where it goes. But I hope in the meantime, since you can't change infrastructure, getting those electric buses in immediately to help and phasing in those buses to be those middle ground to get people to and from the, the railroad station. And I'm in full support of the one up in the, the second half by the naval base. Um, and I, I think it could do some good you know, justice for our community. So that's my hope. How long would it take to get some relief um, to get us on the bus, to get us moving around in our own neighborhoods? Thank you. So uh, last summer, the governor's office reached out to um, the DOT and asked us to put together a package of potential bus service enhancements. Um, so I polled all the operators around the state, 
um, and we, you know, compiled a big list. We looked at, you know, prioritizing things like access to employment, um, access to education. Where were there systems that um, had these big gaps in service? Like, for example, Southeast Area Transit, no Sunday service. Um, and So uh, one of the, the proposals that came in was from Southeast Area Transit, and it includes a whole host of improvements that are based on a comprehensive analysis that they had done of their system a few years ago. So I can take your contact information and put you in contact with Michael Carroll, and he can tell you about what they're planning on doing in that Southeast region, um, and you can let him know what your needs are more directly. Um, as for electric buses, so, um, we are moving forward, uh, trying to implement the, the governor and the legislature's mandate on um, electric buses and getting them rolled out. We have uh, probably $25 million, I think, set aside for the work that we need to do at Southeast Area Transit. Um, so it's not a simple fix, because it's not, not just us. We need the utilities, we need the transmission, we need to get that transmission into our facilities and, and get our facilities ready to charge these buses. But we are moving forward to achieve the goals that were set for us. Uh, I, I just wanted to thank you for your comments and everything. And I'd love to, I'll leave my contact information if I can be of any help um, mm -hmm. just to speak. And maybe we can bring in some people that live in these dense areas that need the bus transit and explain what the needs are. Okay. Thank you. And, and you have a great voice. You should be on the radio. Uh, thank you. I mm -hmm. wish I could sing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Zell, really thank you for clearing the room out. You are very, very effective. Before you got up to talk, the room was full. Uh, I happen to be the vice chair of the EDC from Westerly. Before Zell spoke, we had five citizens on this side, three members of the EDC. We had the uh, town uh, manager here. We had only one of the two town councilors who could come tonight. The other one has a schedule conflict. And the point of that diatribe is, Wesley's very interested in this. It's not passive to us whatsoever. We understand that RIDOT doesn't have very many people, if anyone, who knows much about rail. However, this gentleman right here, Alex Barato, if you have today's uh, day, He's got the editorial in, in there about the parking garage versus a, a rail station. He and, and the rest, and, and I forget your name. Peter Broussard. Peter Broussard from the Rhode Island side of the, the, the I forget the acronym. Rhode Island Association of All right. So we've got a lot of expertise and interest on our side. It's unformed at this point. Um, I'm going to editorialize on why we're interested a little bit, then ask you a specific question. Uh, this, this, well, she's gone now, but uh, Senator Summers talked about how we're not Fairfield, and we have the, exactly the same problem in southwestern Connecticut, Rhode Island that you have in southeastern Connecticut. Hartford doesn't pay much attention to you folks. Providence doesn't pay much attention to us. The big economic engines in the Northeast are Boston and New York, and any bright idea that comes up, all the, all the oxygen, oxygen gets sucked out of the room for them. However, there is a natural, existing, standing, extant economy from, uh, from uh, uh, to the east in, in South Kingston, all the way to at least New London and beyond to New Haven. And it's not being properly addressed by any infrastructure for moving people around, except for those silly roads. The silly roads where they in, in, induce demand and you add more roads and you get more roads full of cars doing nothing. However, to, to Zell's point, there's, there's an economic opportunity here. If you build this infrastructure, if you let it get in place, all the towns up and down that economy will be better connected. All the businesses will have better access to intelligence and, and people and staff. Everybody who wants to just uh, relax and, and do recreation will be much better off in the entire area. It's an economic catalyst. It's a catalyst for transit-oriented development. I, I heard in a conversation earlier that Governor Lamont was in favor, wasn't in favor of the, uh, the 
the shoreline east because towns like Guilford wouldn't do uh, low and moderate income housing. The logic is backwards. If you put the trains, trains in, if you put the stations in, then the low, to, low and moderate income housing is obvious even to the people who don't want it or haven't thought of it clearly through in a town like Guilford. Westerly uh, happens to have enough space in it for a terminal so that you could park trains there overnight. We're very, very valuable for anyone who wants to have trains going up and down the East Coast from New Haven through to just to service Stonington, one hop further, we have the place to store them. And we have, because this entire row of people, plus our town manager, plus, plus the, uh, the members of the town council, we're very interested in helping. So the question is, what organized or structural efforts do you need from us to help you out? When I have that meeting starting later this week, I'll start having those discussions. We, I work very closely with Stephen Devine, if you know who he was at RIDOT. He was the rail administrator, so it's the two states working together going forward on those opportunities. We are in Connecticut, you're in Rhode Island, but they have to come to the table as well. So I would suggest, like we do on our side, we work through our organization, through the administration, the same thing has to happen there, but I'll bring it into the conversations. Hopefully you can hear, oh, thank you. I'm, a, I'm an uh, aging senior in, on the Groton side of the Mystic River. And one of the things that uh, I've always been a little bit distraught about is, you know, I have no alternative to get around unless I get in my car and drive. I want, I have tried this, the op service in Stonington, I, I found that to be some really nice parts of it and sometimes not so enjoyable. Uh, I've taken it from Mystic Flagpole to Porkatuck and walked into Westerly. So I was able to get there in a half hour and it was, that ride was fantastic, it went very well. And the next time I tried to take it, I was in the Mystic Flagpole in the mini bus or mini transit, whatever you call it, was over in Porkatuck, and I had to wait a half hour <laughs> to get on it, to get it, so it was an hour's trip. So I mean, there's a lot can be done in that area to increase the service so that the uh, customer gets more satisfactory. As I find, even myself, if I'm gonna go to Walmart, say, if I can, I can wait five or 10 minutes for a bus to arrive, take me there, and then maybe wait five or 10 minutes for a bus to take me home. But I'm not gonna wait a half hour because I'll get in my car and drive there. I think, that, I think you need to be more aggressive on uh, the amount of buses that are available. I mean, if you had uh, more buses on the on-demand system, which I think is fantastic, picks you up at your door and takes you, get, right where you want to go, uh, that would be absolutely great. Uh, one of the things I noticed about it is that if for some reason you can't make the connection, and it happens two or three times, they had, you put out a threat that uh, you won't be able to use it. Uh, I was wondering if you could uh, set it up so that if you don't make the bus, you just charge the fare. I mean, especially now that you have like uh, the toll booths where you just load the account and if, you know you can charge the fare for the bus. And on the other side of that coin, if the transit bus is 10 minutes late, you know, I don't see it, it might be beneficial for the individual to get a free ride for wherever he's going. And that would be an incentive on both sides to make the service better. Because people won't use it if it isn't convenient. I've heard that a number of times here. Uh, maybe I would because I'm older. My driving skills aren't as good as they were when I was 30 years old. I'll be the first to admit it. <laughs> oh.
hopefully everybody will get home safe with me on the road. But, you know, I do realize that eventually I'm going to have to give up driving. My wife will have to do the same. Right now, we, you know, we feel fairly comfortable. I prefer to drive in the daytime. Uh, some, some of the other things I had, uh, I wanted to mention. Uh, I've been working with my grandson since he was a freshman in high school. He's now in his third year at Dean up in Massachusetts on a system that would uh, get people uh, from point A to point B a far more efficient than a uh, two or 3,000 ton automobile or a, I don't know how many tons of trains are, but they look really, really heavy. <laughs> uh, and it, would be, it could get you from here to California perhaps as fast as it would take you to get to the airport, hop in a plane, get off the plane, get your bags, and get a ride to your final destination. Uh, that's got a long way to go. Uh, we've, we've got some really good ideas that maybe he'll see through. I'll never see them in my lifetime. But uh, it basically would be, you would have a, uh, a, machine, a, a vehicle that can come separate from the chassis and be loaded onto a track, say it could go down the highway, travel 120 miles an hour or more from, one, from wherever you want to go, nonstop to wherever you want to end up. And you know, if you want to get off in between, you'd be sidetracked. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we've talked about. Uh, and the one thing that we noticed in that whole process was we've got to get people out of their cars. To give, there wouldn't be any point in having that system if people still were so much in love with driving in their car that they wouldn't use it. So I've heard that point be made here too. Uh, I do support the fact that uh, we got to move really fast because of the environment. Uh, the carbon emissions from a bus is 101, as I looked up on Google, 101 grams per uh, kilometer. In, the, in an automobile, it's 271 grams per kilometer. So the, the average person actually drives uh, and produces 15.24 uh, uh, their carbon footprint, anyway, is 15.4 here. And in Europe, theirs is 6.8. So there's clearly a big problem in this country with being very car-centric. Uh, they seem to have ruled the land. And I think we could benefit a lot. I don't know if people watch the uh, pod, uh, podcast called Not Just Bikes, but they talk about all the benefits about uh, making it more livable. I've noticed in some cities now they have places where you, where you have multi-housing units and you can have grocery stores and all within walking distance, liquor stores and entertainment, all within walking distance so you never have to get around at all. And lifestyle is really nice. Anyway, uh, those are some of the points I wanted to make. Uh, Ray, I, yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't have any more. Uh, I'll, I'll just add those points. I'll leave this with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just a quick response, Ray, on the, the hop system. Um, so we actually took the, the bus route that was operating in Stonington. Um, it was operating, this was Southeast Area Transit. They, they took that bus route that operated every two hours and they replaced it with the hop system. So having to wait a half an hour is still better than what was there before. All we need is money and we can put more service out there. Okay. okay. What can I do to help you get the money? I don't have enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, this particular program and, and the, the transit um, things that they have in it could help support all sorts of um, improvements in the transit system in the area. Sure. It's on, right? Yep. All right. Thank you. Just to introduce myself, my name is Alex Berardo. 
I'm a lifelong resident of Westerly, and I'm the West Bay Coordinator for the Rhode Island Association of Railroad Passengers. Just want to say briefly at the beginning, thank you all for the work that you did on this study. Um, and I do want to recognize and echo what Doug Brockway, member of the EDC for Westerly, had said. A good chunk of the people in this room were from Westerly. We're very enthusiastic. We recognize the potential for commuter rail for this town and for Rhode Island in general. And we have already begun the work necessary to secure the infrastructure upgrades that would be needed for Westerly Station to receive Shoreline East and for enhancement of its own Amtrak service. So I have a question about your estimate for the operating costs for the option one scenario, which would extend all Shoreline East trains to Westerly. And that was the preferred alternative within that Westerly to New London corridor. Um, your operating cost estimate struck me as a little high. So I read back through Appendix J where it was discussed in detail to understand how it was calculated. And just for the benefit of anybody who may be listening, um, the relevant section said the estimated operating expense was determined by identifying an expense per train mile and then multiplying by the number of forecasted train miles per service day to determine an operating cost per weekday. So there's a relationship there um, where operating expenses increase proportionally with increases in train miles traveled and the various alternatives that were shown in the chart bore that out. So for option one, for example, Extending all the trains to Westerly, the study showed that train miles would double from 1,100 to 2,200, and operating costs would double from 26 million to 52 million. Um, but what I'm having trouble understanding is just how the train miles would increase by about 100% under that alternative when the extension to Westerly only adds about a 40% increase over the length of the existing route as measured from New Haven to New London. It's about 50 miles versus an additional 20 being put on. Um, given the situation that was described in option one, the baseline that was identified, which basically had all trains running to New London, I was wondering if any of you could help me to understand where all those additional miles come from and why it would be a 100% increase in operating expenses instead of something more like a 40% increase. Sure, thank you for the, for, thank you for the question. Um, and the, the train miles come from the level of service, uh, sorry, the, the train miles come from the level of service in the service plan, uh, which includes, um, what is it, eight round trips in, no, that's, that's the other one, uh, 12 round trips uh, per day in each direction, I have to get the right corridor uh, in mind um, on, on weekdays. Um, we did estimate a per weekday cost, so that's where, where that, um, that number came from, and it was $98 per, per train mile uh, for that expansion. Uh, so we also are um, looking at this as a, as a new service, uh, so we also escalated uh, the, the operating costs because this is a new service and we're looking at a, a later horizon year. Um, so uh, that there it's, um, that's where the estimate comes from and the train miles are associated with, with the level of service. We will of course go back and look at the detailed number of train miles uh, to help answer your question in more detail since I don't have it in front of me right now. Yes. Uh, hello, um, I have a question and I'd like to address something that I find uh, pretty irritating that uh, public transportation planners uh, sometimes do, and that is they uh, sometimes they underestimate the uh, ridership figures for a transit project. Um, and what this does is it makes the transit project look more successful in the end because it it's like, wow, there's way more riders than we expected. But that has the unattended consequence of building uh, way less transit than is what's needed. Uh, and their, your transit system is overstressed and doesn't, isn't able to um, accommodate the riders that need it. So my question is, are your ridership figures accurate? And if they're not, could you please change them? Because I don't want to see a situation where the trains are so full that paying passengers with tickets in their hands are being uh, not loud on the train by the conductors, which is something that we have seen on the Hartford line, uh, especially during Thanksgiving. 
Um, and I would argue that the Hartford line uh, had its ridership figures clearly underestimated, and we're seeing some of the pro problems associated with that today. Thanks very much. So I can answer that one um, quickly, and we can talk more, because I know we're trying to wrap up. So when we started the Hartford line, yes, there was estimates, and even all of us were surprised how many more folks in year one. Uh, we, we grew the ridership from about 350,000 to 720,000 in just year one. So, um, you know, your point about how they, us, uh, it's just the enthusiasm around that and how that whole service just really blossomed. We also have the U-Pass out there and we had a lot of UConn students. I look at the ridership today, UConn's there, and we're still at 60 students a day, where we were at 200. So, so things have changed with COVID, so that's another thing to talk about there. But um, the, the concern about Amtrak and their trains, their two-car sets, were four-car sets. Again, as I mentioned to some other folks tonight, when we deal with not only our service provider, but Amtrak, even with the conductors, when they control the train, some conductors will allow an extra 20 people to get on the train, where other conductors will say, nope, every seat's full. My handheld device says this is a sold out train. We're not gonna allow anybody on. But to answer that for you on Thanksgiving, myself and our team is out there in full force. We bring buses, we bring the rubber over to the rail side to help carry loads. Our goal is to move people. It's, we call it like the Christmas week. It's the Thanksgiving week. It starts with the Friday before because a lot of kids leave UConn and other schools to go home for the, tw uh, the week. But we're out there and we try to provide additional busing capacity to help move people around. I hear again, like I said to another individual about the, you know, the horns, about your complaint. We constantly are talking to Amtrak. We're buying new coaches. And some of our strategy is to utilize that equipment, even with theirs, because we do pay for that service, even though it's their property, but we want to bring on larger capacity. So I can talk to you more after this if you want to, to uh, talk about the Harford line. But that, that did grow a lot. But it's, it's, it's all coming back slow, you know, it's, uh, when we look at ridership. All right, thank you, Rich. And I was going to say, uh, Stephen, there is an appendix. There is an appendix uh, that talks all about the ridership methodology. It is different from the rail side to the transit side, um, but if you leave your name and number, I'd be happy to talk through that. If you have any questions, we absolutely can uh, try to answer all those questions after this meeting. For anyone that's still here, thank you very much for uh, making it all the way through. There are still two more meetings. Both of them are tomorrow, and um, if you have any questions, feel free to email the uh, project website. Someone will get back to you. Thank you very much. <laughs>